So as you know, we're coming off of our soul winning challenge for the month of February. And we've got a few days left for that. But I wanted to preach this morning about our next challenge. And we're, if you haven't noticed by now, now that we're starting another challenge, we're going to be doing multiple challenges. And they're going to last a month. And the goal of all of these challenges is to help to transform our minds and to be thinking about things and to forming good habits of things that we know we ought to be doing according to Scripture. We know we ought to be preaching the gospel to every creature, right? We know that we can make that, that assessment in our head and say, yeah, I see that in the Scripture. Yes, I know it's something I should be doing. But we don't want to just stop there and just say, well, I know it's something I should be doing. And then just keep living your life, same old routine, day in, day out, doing the same exact thing. The challenge is designed to say, hey, we're going to focus on this. Every single day, I don't want to forget about this. We're going to be thinking about who can I talk to today? Okay, now we're going to do this for, and we're doing this for a month. And the goal is to be able to say when that month is over, the, the, the soul winning isn't over. The, the, the mindset hasn't changed. That we're, we've, we've introduced a new pattern of thinking so that way when you're out and about, you're, you're going to be thinking about it more often and, and we change our habits, we change our routines, we change our, ha our, our um, priorities even, and our mindset to be thinking about the things we need to be doing. So the next challenge we'll be doing is for the month of March, every single day through the month of March, is a prayer challenge. Okay, this is, a, this is something that, I, you know, all of them, I want to see 100% participation, I want everybody to get involved in this, but prayer is something that I think gets left by the wayside way too often. I know this is something that I've personally struggled with just in general, making sure I'm spending enough time in prayer. And there's many, many points, there's many sermons you could preach on prayer in general. And there's so many reasons why we believe it. But first of all, you have to have the faith, right, that God's going to hear our prayers. And we see that in John chapter 16, we're going to get to that in a minute, but I want to, I want to outline the prayer first, and then I'm going to get into all the points and kind of explain uh, scripturally and biblically why we ought to be doing this. And so for the prayer challenge for the month of March, every single day, I want you to pray for a minimum of 15 minutes every day. I'm going to put a time on it. Now, if you normally already do this, up that. Okay, just do that personally. Up that time, you know, add, add another 15 minutes or something, whatever, whatever it may be. Hopefully you're in that, that pattern already, but if you're not, let's do 15 minutes. Okay, I don't think anybody doesn't have 15 minutes out of their day to spend talking to God. I think that's, that's probably on the light side, but we're trying, you know, I, we need to get started somewhere. This is designed mostly for people who don't have this as a regular routine. Let's set aside some time to, to spend in prayer unto God. So we're going to put 15 minutes aside. I want you to pray every single day in, in March for everyone on our prayer list. Okay, so take these home with you. This is part of the challenge, and this is what we want. We get a lot of participation on this. I'm glad for it. There's everyone in our church, when there's a need, when there's a request, when we have something, someone needs to be prayed for, we bring it up. I mean, everybody's brought people up on here, and I, and I appreciate that. I'm glad. But I don't want these just to be you know, just ink on a paper that we just look over every once in a while and then forget about it. Take these home with you. So if you're wondering, I don't know what I'm going to pray for 15 minutes every day. Well, here's a great start. We're going to be praying for all the people on this list every single day. I also want you to keep track of your prayers and when God answers them. This is also extremely important. Um, I, I am going to diverge now from my... Um, from the Because those are the three things in the challenge that I want to do. I've got a couple other points here, but look at John 16, at the last verse. Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We have a lot of problems in this world. We know we're going to have tribulation, especially the more godly you live, the more righteous you live, the more you know, of, of following the path of Jesus that you're, you're trying to live, you're trying to walk in your life. You're going to have tribulation. We all have tribulation, but, but the more that you, you try to live Christ, like the more it's going to come. But Jesus says, look, we know that there's going to be problems. You know that there's going to be troubles, but be of good cheer. Why should we be of good cheer? Why should we be happy even though we have troubles? Because Jesus has overcome the world. And previously in this chapter, look at verse number 23. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He says, and in that day, you shall ask me nothing. 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Jesus wants us to have joy. God wants us to have joy. He wants our joy to be full. He doesn't want us sulking about. Now, he warns us and says, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have problems. You're going to be persecuted. You're going you're to go through various stages in your life, but you can have joy. Why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus has overcome everything. We can go to him. We have a God. We have a, 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 you know, the God, the Father, that's going to listen to us. And he says, ask and ye shall receive. We have a loving Father in heaven that is listening to his children and is ready to hear your prayers. As far as keeping track of your prayers and when God answers them, I didn't have this in my notes, but I thought about it right before I came up here, so I'm just going to bring it up now. You remember the story? I brought it up, I think it was this last week, uh, of the, the ten lepers that were cleansed. And one of them turn back to praise God and to thank Jesus, right? So 10 lepers came up to Jesus and they said, you know, they wanted to be healed. They wanted to be cleansed. So Jesus says, I will be thou clean. And then he says, you know, go and, and show the priest. And, and they went away. And as they were going, actually, he didn't say, I will be thou clean. He didn't say that it was in, in this parable or in this story, not a parable. It's an actual story. They came to be cleansed and he just said, go your way and, and, and show unto the priest and basically keep fulfilling the, the, the Old Testament laws about uh, leprosy. And as they were going away, they realized, hey, we're, we're, we're clean. We're, you know, he healed us. But only one of them returned to thank God, to thank Jesus, right? And, and said, thank you for that. And he says, wait, didn't I heal 10? Where are the nine? Now, when I preached on that a couple weeks ago, the the, the symbolism there was, was salvation, right? We're talking about salvation, people getting saved. But what did he really do? I mean, he was answering a prayer. They wanted to be healed. They all wanted to be healed, and he was answering a prayer. Too often, I think, we ask God to answer our prayers at the time because they're important to us, right? If you have leprosy, you have a physical ailment like that, you're having all kinds of problems, and you're praying out to God, say, God, help me. But way too often, I think we're probably part of the nine when God answers our prayers and then we just go about our business and just, just live our life and keep going instead of stopping and saying, God, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for answering my prayer when I was in need and you actually listened to me and you healed me and you helped me. You got me through whatever it was. Thank you, Lord. When you can keep track of your prayers and God answering them, it's going to give you a much, much deeper appreciation for God and realize God really does answer prayers. But you have to be paying attention. You have to be looking for it. You have to be thinking about it. So what I'm asking you in this challenge is to write down your prayers. We have prayers written down right here. And this is also why, as you noticed this morning, I do my best to... to Praise God for all of the answered prayers. When we get the good reports and we say, thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. But you keep this an, as a note for yourself. I assume you're going to be praying for other things than just the people on this list. I mean, you got 15 minutes to pray. And, and most people do. You're going to be praying for a lot of your own needs, and you should. Absolutely. But try this. Try to write down the things that you plan on praying for as much as you can and keep that list for the whole month. And then mark when they get answered. Okay? And, and pay attention to that. And, then, and thank God for it too. And I think you're going to see some amazing things that God does when he hears your prayers. And, and it's going to increase your faith and increase your joy. When we pr provide that recognition. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 7. A couple other points as far as when we're when you're participating in this prayer challenge, if you're married, I suggest try praying with your spouse out loud together. I, I found this to be very helpful. I think this is something that'll help your relationship. It's just a side note. I don't have any scripture on this. Just an um, experience. Okay, It's good to hear and it's good to pray for each other. 
When you're married, pray for your spouse. Especially when you're going through more difficult times. Maybe you have a, a, a fight or something. Some, you know, they annoy you. Pray for them. I found that to be helpful. I mean, when I started doing this, when I would get just real angry or something at my wife or something that she did or something I did or whatever the case may be, it doesn't matter. When you just take a, you know, take a step back and just say, you know what, I love my wife and I'm just going to pray, you know, like, she's wrong again, so I'm just going to pray for her. <laughs> that's always the case, right? They're always the one that's wrong. But when you pray for them, it, it softens you up a little bit. So, you know, because most, most of the time, there's no purpose to be as angry as we tend to get or as bitter or whatever. You know, we shouldn't be bitter. But um, usually fights tend to be something trivial and, and simple and kind of dumb. And, and our pride gets in the way and things like that. So when you spend time praying uh, for each other, that's good. But not just when you're fighting and stuff, but even when things are going great. Take the time together and pray. Let your, let your spouse hear that you're praying for them, that they, that they could hear you talking to God and asking for specific prayers, they'll know now that you really are thinking about them. That, that you are concerned with their health and their well-being when, when you're praying to God for that person. The, the, it'll be a, a special connection that'll, that'll help you in your marriage. Also, spend some time praying on your knees. Get on your knees and humble yourself before God and spend some time in prayer that way as well. Um, that's, some, again, something that, that I think is um, you know, some of the humility. Now, you know, everything that we do in church here, we try to do for a reason. We, we have, you know, means for it. So if you notice, every time we pray here, we bow our heads and close our eyes. And the reason for that is just humility. There is the story of the, of the, the Pharisee and the publican that went in to the house of God to pray. And the Pharisee was all proud and lifted up. He said, I thank thee, God, you know, that I'm not some sinner like this publican over here. He's like, I, I pray, I fast twice in the week, I do all this stuff, and, and God, I just thank you for that, right? And he's all lifted up in himself. But the publican, he said, he wouldn't lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. And he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, right? And, and this is the example we have. This is the humility of an example that we follow, which is, which is why we incorporate that. And, you know, we need to just bow our, you know, humble ourselves, bow ourselves. So, we, so when we go to God, we go to God in humility. We go to God not lifted up, and we go to him asking for God for, for, for help or whatever it is. Because prayer, really what prayer is, is means you're asking. That's all it means. The word pray is an old word. It means to ask. So when we go to God in prayer, we're asking God for something. If you go to God, like, like we do oftentimes, or every time we eat, we, we thank God for the food that we have. That's not a prayer. You're just thanking God. Prayer is when you're asking for something. So we ask God to bless the food. We ask God for other things. That's a prayer. But um, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. You're in Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse number 7. See, one of the great things about prayer is that it's promised to us to work. If you believe in the promise of eternal life, if you believe that Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, this is no less of a promise. This is straight out of the word of God. Look at what we see in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7. Again, straight out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So he's relating here. He's saying, look, if you ask, it's going to be given to you. Everyone that asketh receiveth. We need to go to God in prayer. Why? Because it's promised to work. He says it's going to work, and he, think, he, he, he gives you an analogy here of a father and a son. And he says, look, if, if, what father is there that's going to say if their son is hungry and he's asking for some bread, that dad's just going to be like, okay, here's a rock. Choke on it. Right? That's not going to happen. He's like, you know, no father, no loving father is going to do that. The same way that we have a loving father in heaven, look, when you have these needs, and I do mean needs, by the way. Don't think that Jesus is referring to becoming a millionaire and winning the lottery. 
when he's, when he's saying, ask and you shall receive. Okay, don't, don't think that that's what he's talking about. That's why he brings up the example of a hungry son looking for bread. That's, you know, we need food. We need clothing. We need certain things in our life. There's a lot of things that we don't need, but we have needs. And we go to God when we have these problems, we have these needs. He's not going to turn us down. What, what father would he be if he just said, no, I have a stone? When we go to God and we ask him for things, he says, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Look at verse 12. Therefore, so for this reason, because we know that God gives things unto his children, therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And this is a little insight into you want to get your prayers answered. He says, for this reason, you know, God's a God that hears his children. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. The way that you treat other people, God looks at that. God sees that. Whatever you want to have happening to you, you ought to be living the life of, of um, doing so unto others. And God will see that from heaven and he blesses that and he hears that. So, um, and think about this. You could, you could, I brought this up recently as well, but it's a good example. You think about children. I think about my own children. My own children come to me and they ask me for something. They're saying, Dad, I want this. Dad, I want that. Dad, I'm, can I have a snack? But they're always hoarding everything. They're, always, you know, they're never being nice to anyone else. Or, you know, they're not listening to the things that I tell them to do. Well, as a father, now I'm going to give them what they need. You know, especially if they come to me and, and, and they're starving. I'm going to give them what they need. But the more I see a good attitude in them, the more I see them doing what's right, the more I see that they're listening to me, the more I'm going to bless them. The more I'm going to go above and beyond the things that they're asking for. And this is the way that God operates as well. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. So we know that prayer works because it's been promised to work. We, we, you know, Jesus Christ himself has promised. He said, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. And one of the things I think we forget is the power in prayer. There's a lot of power in prayer. There's as much power in prayer as God has power. Think about that. But it's not us. It's not, the power doesn't lie in us. The power lies in God. But that's who we're going to, to do things for us, to, a, to ask him for, for things. The power comes from God, but the power, you know, he doesn't necessarily do things unless we ask him. So look at Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also... If ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. So we see another thing here, another aspect of prayer, that we need to have faith when we go to God and pray. Not only, do, you know, we saw earlier that we should be doing, you know, things unto other people, we would have them do, done unto us. God sees that. Also, when we pray, don't doubt in your heart. Don't, don't say, oh, God can't do this. There's, power, there's so much power in prayer that Jesus said, you know, if you pray, you, know, you think this is a big deal? Because he caused the fig tree not to have fruit come on it. He basically caused the fig tree just to, to kind of dry up and die. And they were amazed at that. They're like, wow. I mean, he just, just said a word, and, and this is what happened. He said, you think that's, that's something? He says, you ask in prayer, he says, you could, you could remove that mountain. That's a lot of power. Turn, if you would, to the book of Acts. Uh, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 12. We're going to look at a story here. I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 31 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So again, we see the result of prayer. When they had prayed, they prayed first, the place was shaken, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and then they had boldness to preach the word of God. You think about things that you need to pray for? Pray for boldness. This is a common theme of, of the apostles and throughout the Bible, people praying for boldness, praying for God to empower you, the Holy Ghost, to preach the word of God, to not 
to not hold back, to not withhold the truth of God, to not be scared, to not be ashamed, to not think, oh, I don't know what this person's going to react, to not fear any repercussions, but be able to boldly preach the word of God. Pray to God for that. That's a great prayer. God's going to answer that prayer. We're in Acts chapter 12. Along the same lines of believing when you pray, right? That is one of the concepts that we just saw in Matthew. Believe when you pray. Look at Acts chapter 12. And we're going to see power in the prayer here in this story. Acts chapter 12, verse number 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So Apostle Peter was, was thrown into prison for preaching Jesus, right? When the church heard about this, when they found out he was arrested, the Bible says that they prayed without ceasing. So they got together and they're praying, they're praying for Peter. Let's keep reading the story. Verse number six, and when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So he was kept pretty tight, locked up in chains. He's got guards right outside of his cell. I mean, he's not going anywhere. At least that's what Herod thinks. Verse number seven, and behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying, arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forth with the angel departed from him. So all of these amazing things are happening. He's, you know, his chains just fall off. This angel is just like, hey, get up, you know, chains fall off. And he's just leading them right out of the prison. So Peter's just thinking like, I'm dreaming, right? I mean, when does this ever happen? This must be a dream, so okay, I'll go along with it. Cool, you know, I'm getting out of prison in his dream. So he's out. The angel departs from him. Look at verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So he finally realized that this isn't a dream. Like, wait a, minute, wait a minute, I'm out. Like, I'm out of prison. That angel came and, and, you know, God sent him to get me out of prison. So he's like, this is cool. I'm going to go over here to this house where it must have been a house where a lot of the, the saints met. And uh, verse 13 says, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they'd opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. So Peter shows up to this house where they're all praying for him, because he's in prison, right? They're praying that God releases him. They're praying that God releases him. He knocks on the door. He knocks on the gate. And the girl sees him. She's super excited, and in her excitement, she doesn't, you know, let him in. She goes back, and she's like, hey, Peter's here, Peter's here, you know, like, and they're like, you're crazy. Peter's in prison. He's not here. Showing their doubt. I mean, what were they doing there? They were praying for Peter. They're praying for, for you know, for God to, to send Peter out of the prison. God answers that prayer. And the first thing they do, no, no, that's not true. No, Peter's not here, right? But then, of course, Peter is there, and he's still just knocking like, uh, hello, you guys can't let me in. And then they open the door and says they were astonished, so they were amazed. But I also want to point out, now, they didn't, they didn't have very much faith in what they're praying, but they did have some. They didn't expect that to happen. They should have. They should have. They didn't. But we also see how little faith God even requires of us to still be able to answer prayers. Now he says, you know, pray and believe. He's saying this is what you need to have this faith. And I do believe that they were praying earnestly for Peter and believe that God could help him 
They just didn't realize the way that God was going to answer their prayer, which is kind of like, they're like, no, that's not Peter. Like, like he's still in prison. They're praying for, you know, they're probably thinking in their minds that God would work in Herod's heart and that, and that he would be released a normal way. But see, we don't know how God's going to answer prayers. Their specific prayers probably weren't asking for a jailbreak. Probably not what they were thinking. I mean, it's, it's, it's a wild guess, but I think it's a pretty educated guess. It's probably not what they're thinking since they were astonished at him being there. But we need to be able to recognize that and, and say that, you know, what, God's going to answer prayers. He's not always going to do it the way that we think in our minds. But let's pay attention to it because, I mean, in this case especially, God did it in a much more awesome way. This is an amazing story. I love this story that, that he just shows up and, you know, God's able to, to bring him out of that prison. No problem. And it gives us joy. It gives us comfort in, in knowing that God's capable of anything. It's a reminder. God truly is capable of anything. In the most, you know, um, the worst situations that we have, the, the most impossible situation you might find yourself in, I mean, having shackles, being chained to the floor and having guards just, just feet away from you. That's a pretty impossible situation. What am I going to do? Well, you aren't going to be able to do anything, but you know what God can do? God can do anything. God could walk you right out of that prison without anybody finding out. This is why. This is the power. This is why we go to God in prayer in the most impossible situations. Derek, who has ALS that we've been praying for, I pray for many things for Derek, but you know what I also pray for? I pray for a miracle. God is capable of healing. Just as much as he was back then, he is now. God is capable of all these things, but we need to believe and understand, hey, God can do a multitude of things. God could do things that, that I'm not even thinking about that, that, that maybe he will do in these, in these cases. But we need to be praying and asking and going to God for these things. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 14. Matthew chapter 14. Now, we are commanded in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 5, there's this whole list. The Bible says, rejoice evermore. And then it says, pray without ceasing. There's a commandment for us. We're supposed to be praying. Remember, the whole point is we're, we're, we're doing this challenge. We need to increase our prayer level. We need to do more for God and, and do more for other people and do more for us by, through prayer unto God. We are called to pray without ceasing. And we see Jesus Christ in Matthew 14 as the perfect example. Jesus Christ is our example in, in, in all things, the way that we need to live our life. But when you can take a step back and recognize the amount of work that Jesus did, of course, John said, you know, if, if, if you were to try to write down all the things that Jesus did, you know, the world would not be able to contain the books that would be written about him. That's how much work that Jesus did. That's how many people he impacted. That's how many, how many healings, how many stories there were, all the things that were going on about Jesus Christ. Said, the whole world can contain the books that would be written about that. That's a lot of work done by one man in a short period of time. But on top of all of that, we're going to start reading here in verse number 14. Jesus made time to pray. And the reason why we're going over this is a lot of people say, well, I don't have time. I'm too busy. I've got so many other things going on. I know I need to be reading my Bible. I'm coming to church. I've got bills to pay. I'm working. I'm doing all this stuff. I just don't have time to pray. Jesus had time to pray. Let's look at verse number 14. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. So we see here Jesus Christ, where we started reading, 
He healed their sick. He's teaching. He's healing. He's feeding them. You know, all these various things. He sends his disciples away. And then he says, you know what? It's my alone time with God now. After a full day's work. Now he's saying, okay, now I'm going to go pray. He goes up in a mountain to pray. And he's like, you guys get on the boat and just get headed over there. Now I'm going to walk. Knowing he's got this journey ahead of him, he doesn't say, oh man, I got to get prepared for the journey. I got to do all this other stuff. I don't think I'm going to have energy. I can't pray right now because I just need to get going because I'm walking and they're going in a boat. No. He prayed. And we don't know exactly how long he prayed, but it had to have been pretty light because he sent the people away in the daytime. And then he says when it was evening, you know, he was all by himself. He prayed. He didn't catch up to them until the fourth watch. So... Each watch is like a few hours long. I mean, this is like, this is like the wee hours, of the, like right, probably right before dawn. That Jesus Christ, he is obviously up all night. He was healing during the day, feeding people, teaching the people, sent them away, goes to pray, and then is walking to meet back up with his disciples. That's a lot of work being done. Mind you, yes, we know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. We know this. But we also know that Jesus Christ was a man as well. He was God, but he was in the flesh. He felt and suffered the same things that we do as a result of this flesh. He, he wasn't a, uh, you know, a superhero in the sense that his flesh didn't have the same infirmities that our flesh has. That he didn't get tired and he didn't get weary. Yes, he did. But he was able to push himself to do more. And we need to learn to push ourselves sometimes that even though we may be weary, even though we have problems going on, we could still go to God in prayer. We could still stay up the extra 15 minutes. Jesus was up all night. Our challenge is 15 minutes. Think about that too when you're, when you're, when you're going through in the month of March and saying, I just don't have time for this. Hopefully you can remember this story of what Jesus did and say, you know what? I do have time for this. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. I'm going to read another example of Jesus Christ in Luke 6. Luke 6, 12 reads, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples and of them he chose 12, whom also he named apostles. So Jesus Christ spent all night in prayer. All night. And then continues to work the next day. Now, one of the things I think is important here too is that we're seeing an example of Jesus Christ. He had important decisions to make on choosing out the disciples. I believe that's why he spent, because no, it's not a coincidence that these verses go one after the other. He spent all night in prayer to God I think asking for wisdom and guidance and, and, you know, and showing them the right way. And, and you know, mind you, he was, he was a man. He was God in the flesh. But the Bible says that he didn't have all knowledge. He limited himself. He grew in wisdom and in stature as he was growing up. He was, he was questioning the doctors and the lawyers. And he, he had a lot. He was smart. He had a lot of wisdom. But he didn't know everything. When Jesus was on this earth, he still didn't know everything. He didn't even know when he was coming back. He says, no man knoweth the day or the hour. He says, not even the Son of Man knows because he didn't have all knowledge. He says, the Father knows. But don't you think Jesus knows now when he's coming back? Of course he does. He's no longer limited or constrained to the physical world that he constrained himself to in order to come and be the propitiation for our sins. But he does now. So we saw here Jesus Christ, he was in, night, in, in prayer all night. And then he goes and uh, calls unto him his disciples. He, he chooses the 12. Now, we ought to remember that when we have big decisions to make, we have important things to do. Go to God for that. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for direction. The Apostle Paul also spent much time in prayer. Jesus is, of course, the best example. But Apostle Paul is a great example as well. We're going to see a certain heart that Paul has for people. And this is, this is very important when it comes to prayer. We need to have our hearts focused on other people and thinking about them and their needs. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 is where I had you turn. Look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, For what thanks can we render to God again for you? 
for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Look at verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. He's speaking to the Thessalonians. Now, the Apostle Paul, he cared about every church that he got started, all the people. You think about the travels during the, the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. He traveled all over the place. He got churches started. We see, literally, in all of his epistles, personal, um, personally you know, looking, you know, asking about people, thinking about people, and praying for people in every single one of his epistles. And I'm going to give you, I've got a bunch of examples. I'm not going to have you turn to them all, but you're going to get to point, the point real quick as I read them for you. He, uh, he also had this, his special relationship with Timothy and Titus, the people he was training to become pastors and were kind of learning from him as well. He spent time in prayer for them. So we saw in 1 Thessalonians 3, hey, night and day he's praying exceedingly. That's a lot. I guarantee you that's not 15 minutes. He said, I'm praying exceedingly for you. He wants the people in Thessalonica to succeed. He wants God to work in their lives. He wants them to do what's right, and he's praying for them exceedingly. 2 Timothy 1.3 says, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing, so no stopping, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. We ought to have this care for our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that Paul did. Philemon 1.4 says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Talking about Philemon. He says, you know what? I'm always bringing you up in prayer to God. Romans 1.9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Ephesians 1.15, wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Colossians 1, 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. And then in verse 9 it says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. These are just a few of the examples. We saw the church at Ephesus, the church at Colossae, the Romans, at Ephesus, to Philemon, to Titus, to Timothy. He's telling all of them, I'm making mention of you in my prayers. Now, either Paul's just a big fat liar or he's spending quite a bit of time in prayer and really thinking about other people. I think it's the latter. I don't think Paul's some big fat liar with his words being, you know, written down as scripture and the word of God. Now, too many people, I think, throw around the words, I'll pray for you. Hey, I'll pray for you. Hey, I'll, look, don't be found a liar. God hates lies. We, we went over that in the book of Proverbs. You know, these, these six things, the Lord, the, the Lord hates, see, seven are abomination unto him. Lying is mentioned twice in that list. God hates lying. If you're going to tell someone that you're going to pray for them, then do it. Don't just give lip service. You know, I, think, I think a lot of people like to say they're going to pray for someone because it sounds good and because they know that, that the person you're speaking to is going to appreciate that. And the more you, t you, you say that to people, the more people are going to like you. And that's a fact. Some people are like that. Now, we ought not to be like that. I think there's also some people who genuinely want to pray for that person, but then they forget about it. I'm sure that happens as well. We need to make sure, though, either way, you're lying if you're not praying for the person you say you're going to pray for. One of the best ways to make sure you're not going to lie, because I talk to people frequently, especially when we go out knocking on doors, and I'll tell someone I'm going to pray for them. And you know what? I do it right away. Because I don't want to be found a liar later on. 
when I leave from that door, whatever, what I'll do is I'll just, just maybe non-verbally, I'll pray, I'll pray, God, you know, help this person with it, you know, and I'll pray for that person. Or I'll pray for them right there while I'm standing there. But I don't want to be found a liar. And I think it's a good habit to get into if there's people that you're saying you're going to pray for, write it down, make a note of it, or just pray for them right then and there. So that you can actually not be a liar and you're going to, I mean, you're going to be doing good for them by praying for them. We see the heart that was in the Apostle Paul. We ought to be praying, and again, as part of the, uh, I don't have it in my notes as part of the challenge, but for those of you that go out and win people to Christ, one of the things that's on our, our new believers cards is that you're supposed to be praying for those people as well. So I want you to add that to your prayers when, when you lead a person to Christ that you are praying for that person. That you are praying for that person regularly that, that you know, God will work in their hearts, that they could have more opportunities to grow, that they could come to church, that they could get baptized, all these various things. Hey, pray for these people. The Apostle Paul prayed for all the various churches. He had them in his mind and he knew a lot of people by name. He knew a lot of people by name. I don't have it in my notes, but read the last chapter, Romans 16, in the book of Romans. I mean, he's going through, salute this person, salute that person. This is a fellow laborer. He knows all of these people by name. Why? Because he cares about them. It's not just, oh, this one person with the dark hair at that church. Yeah, they were kind of nice. No, he knows them by name, and he's thinking about them and praying for them. And the only way you're going to remember people's names, especially in what, with what he was doing, traveling around and meeting all kinds of different people, and not forgetting their names. Why? Because he was thinking about them regularly and praying for them on a continual basis so that when he comes back years later, he knows who they are. It is effort. There's definitely an effort involved in, in laboring in prayer. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4. We're going to see that here in Scripture. And I think that's why a lot of people don't do it very much, because there is effort involved. Oftentimes, that when, you, when you have a time to kind of set aside to pray, where you're not going to be interrupted, you're going to have some time to set apart alone with God, it's usually either early in the morning or later at night because of just the nature of things, the way things go, especially you got a family, I got kids, or all over the place. There's always distractions, there's always things going on. So in order, like my personal prayer time is in, is in the evening, it's at night, it's before I go to bed. That's when, when I have my time to pray. Now, I think it's good to pray more than once a day. I think we should be praying in the morning, afternoon, and evening, and um, you know, as much as possible. But when you're going to have time, you say, I know I have this time. I could set it apart. This is dedicated unto God. It's dedicated unto this prayer where I'm going to be asking God for things. What you're going to end up finding is that oftentimes you're tired because it's either really early in the morning or it's later at night. And you need to make sure that you can stay awake and do this and understand the importance of it and push yourself to do that work even though you may be exhausted. Colossians chapter number 4, look at verse number 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. So we see here, he's saying, look, we're going to continue in prayer, but I want you to pray for us. Jump down to verse number 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. So here we see he's laboring fervently for you in prayers. This is, this is someone who's dedicated. That's why he says there's a great zeal for you. Epaphras, is, he's, he's spending a lot of time and he's fervently praying for you and he's calling it labor. It's a work. It's definitely something that, that is, that is time-consuming and can take effort to be thinking about all these things and praying for people. Turning forward to James chapter 5. We're almost done. James chapter 5. There's many things to pray for. In James chapter 5, we're going to see why we pray for people who are sick, people who are ill. 
James chapter 5, verse 13, the Bible reads, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. When we have things going wrong in our life when you're being afflicted, when you're being persecuted or afflicted with a disease. Either way, let him pray. We go to God in prayer. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any of sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's that promise again. Look, it is not just you speaking into the wind. It's not you just, just, just your vo words falling on empty ears. When you pray unto God, he says, look, the effectual, Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. First of all, you need to be righteous in the sense that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. You're actually a son of God because you've believed on his name. God's going to hear your prayer as a son, but I think it's more than that. I think he wants you doing what's right because he'll be listening to you even more the more you listen to him. You can become more righteous in the way that you live, in the way that you walk, by listening to God and obeying him. That adds, you know, that's, that's a form of righteousness. So when a righteous man or someone who's listening to God is fervently and effectually just asking to God for help for something, hey, that avails much. He's saying that's, that's actually, you're doing a lot. You're getting somewhere. You're, you're making really good progress in your efforts by effectually praying for people. Verse number 17, he gives us the example of Elijah. It says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So he's saying, you know what? He prayed that it wouldn't rain. He said, here's a man just like we are. Here's a man, he's praying unto God. God answered his prayers. You know, it didn't rain. And then he prayed again. He asked God, hey, can you send the rain down? And God sent the rain. That is the power that was involved right there in that prayer. Effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We need to remember that. Keep that in mind. As, especially as we're told, hey, pray, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. We've got a lot of sick people in this church and outside of this church, friends and family and people on, on, our, on our prayer requests here, they need prayers. They need us going to God and asking God for help. Now, I don't know about you, but if I have problems come up in my life, I'm going to want as many people as possible praying for me because you don't know. I mean, I, want, I, I definitely want the righteous man praying for me. I want the guy who's got, you know, I mean, they're out there. They're working for God. They're doing what's right. I, I want that person praying for me, but, you know, I want everybody praying for me. That early church where Peter was, was, had that prison break, I bet there was a lot of righteous people in that church. And when we know that the apostles were turning the world upside down with their doctrine, we know the church was growing by leaps and bounds, and we know that there was at least 120 people right around that time that were filled with the Holy Ghost and preaching the gospel and getting thousands of people saved, people who are workers and laborers for the Lord. I think that's another reason why God heard their prayer for Peter and, and had such an awesome answer to that prayer. Prayer is a way to serve God. And I, and I don't want to, um, we can't ignore this either. Now, hopefully prayer isn't the only thing that we're doing for God, but I also understand there's, there, there are people, especially when you get older in life or have some disabilities and things, you know, they're going to be limited in their capacity of how they can serve the Lord, Right? We should all be soul winners and take every opportunity that you have, but not everybody has the physical means to go out and knock doors. I get it. There are people out there like that. Now, most of us here don't have that problem, so we should be able to do that, and we don't want to start coming up with any excuse that we can. We all ought to be praying, but if you are limited in some sense, in some way, you can always be in prayer to God and do service that way. The Bible says in Luke 2.37, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. We're talking about a widow who's 84 years old, okay? 
probably not in the best shape to necessarily be going out and doing all kinds of soul winning efforts. It's hot, it's snowy, whatever, all these things are going on. It says, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. You know what this widow woman did, this 84-year-old woman? She was able to pray and fast night and day. I mean, she was always in prayer. She was faithful to God. And this is how she served God. That's what it says. She served God with fastings and prayers night and day. It's a service to God to be doing these things and to be faithful. So, so remember that. I mean, this is important. It's, it's another service to the Lord. 1 Timothy 5.5 5 says, and this is again talking about widows. It says, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. There are people who, you know, for whatever reason, you might find yourself somewhat limited, like older widows. Continue in prayer night and day. It's important. It's something we should be doing. It's a way to serve God. So, things to pray for. Turn if you would to Matthew chapter 6. I think we'll have just enough time to go over this. Matthew chapter 6. We got the prayer challenge. I want you to pray for at least 15. Set time aside for God. Say, I'm going to go to God. I'm going to get my quiet time. I'm going to go into my closet. I'm going to shut my door. Wherever it is you're going to go, I'm going to pray to God. And I'm going to give God at least 15 minutes of my time. Now, I think we should be doing more than that. But this, is again, the challenge is I want everybody to be involved. I want everybody to, to, to start thinking about prayer is important. Prayer works. We need to be praying for people, and especially in this church, more than just about any other church I've ever been in, I think, with the amount of problems and, and, and troubles and um, diseases and sicknesses and physical problems that we've had within our church for the past three years that we've been in existence. There's been more here than any other church that I've seen. Okay, now I'm not saying there's not others that are worse. It's just my personal experience. There's been a lot. You know what that tells me? We need to be praying more. We need to be praying more. People need to be, you know, getting back to full strength. There's a lot more that we could be doing, and I think this is lacking in our church. So what should we be praying for? Other people. Definitely other people. The, the, the normal prayer, I think, that most people, when they actually do end up praying, especially if you're not used to praying very much, the first thing you're going to be thinking about is yourself, right? Again, there's nothing wrong with praying for yourself, okay? Pray for, your, pray for the problems that you have. Go to God when you have problems. But we want to go way beyond just praying to God when we have problems. We want to go to praying to God regularly, every day, and praying for other people. Thinking about other people, having a heart for other people. God's going to see that. He's gonna, again, it's going to be one of those things where you're always focused on other people. Think about the person who always is giving for other people and never thinks about yourself. Don't you have a special place in your heart for someone like that? So that if they ever go through anything, you're like, oh no, not this person. This person, we're not going to allow to go through that. We're going to go above and beyond. We're going to help this person out because they are always generous. They are always giving. They are always helping other people out. So when that person actually has a problem, we're all going to pull together and make sure that they're taken care of, right? I mean, that's, that's normal. I think everyone could agree with that and think, yeah, of course, I know somebody like that. I know there's people like that. Why don't we be those people that are always thinking about and worried about other people and worry about how they're doing and focus on other people's things? And in a roundabout way, you're going to make sure that you're going to be taken care of yourself, Right? But, but, but be genuinely focused and caring for other people. And you know, when you pray for other people, you're going to be, it's going to bring our church together more. When you hear about other problems, you see someone's on a prayer request, hey, I'm going to start praying for that person. You know when you start praying for someone, you want to know how things are going with them. When you're actually praying for them, you want to say, hey, how are things going? And that's going to lead you probably to go say, hey, hey, how are you doing with this? How is this going? How is this person doing? And that's going to build and strengthen the relationships there just because now you're going to care more about that person because you're actually praying for them. You're going to God on their behalf and, and they're in your mind a lot more often. Pray for other people. Pray for your family. Pray for your extended family. Pray for, for people to get saved. You know, pray for all these various things. Pray for your church. Pray for help with sin in your life that God will strengthen you and, and help you to get the victory over whatever sins you're having. Pray for boldness to preach God's word. Pray for help. In, in your time management, that God will help you to do all the things that you need to get done, that God will help you to manage your time to devote. Here's time for prayer. Here's time for church. Here's time for Bible reading. Here's time for soul winning. Here's time for work. Here's time for my family. Here's time for everything else I got going on in my life. God, help me to manage all this stuff so I can do all the things I need to do. Pray for your health. Pray for other people's health. 
Pray for protection from evil. Pray for wisdom. So, you know, God's going to give to those that ask for wisdom, and, you know, abradeth not. It says that in James. We pray for unsaved friends and family. Pray for new converts. I mentioned this already. For people you win to the Lord, pray for the other new converts. Pray for other churches and pastors, and pray that God's will is done. That whatever it is that God wants to happen will be done, and that he can use us to, to perform his will. So many things, and, and look, that's a short list. There's a lot more things that you could be praying for. These are just examples. If you're wondering, what am I going to pray for for 15 minutes? There you go. And I would also suggest this. You're in Matthew chapter 6, right? Jesus gave us a temple, a temple, a template, excuse me, of how we ought to pray. But the challenge where we pray for 15 minutes, we're going to pray for everyone on our prayer request. And I want you to keep track of prayers that get answered. Okay? Because I want to I wanna follow up with people and hear some testimonies at the end of March on answered prayers. Okay? That's, what, that's the goal. And just as it was with the, the soul winning challenge, if you miss a day, don't quit. <laughs> Quitting is the worst thing that you can do. I mean, there, if you quit during the soul winning challenge, or, oh, I screwed up, I missed a day. What about all the other people then that you would have tried to give the gospel to for the rest of the month, but you just gave up on because you, you missed a day? What about them, right? There's always still good to come out of it. Let's, let's keep pushing. You miss a day of prayer, you know, you don't manage your time well, or you fall asleep or something. Just wor worry about that day and say, well, I'm going to get it done today. I'm going to learn from my mistake and I'm going to move forward and not just quit. So don't quit during any of these challenges. We're trying to change our habits and sometimes changing your habits can be difficult. So let's get the 15 minutes in. Let's get the, the, uh, the people prayed for that's on our list and let's keep track of what's being done. And when you're praying too, and, and, and this is something that's going to just take time Get creative with your prayers for people. Don't just say, I want to pray for this person. What is their problem? What is their need? Think about the individuals on this list. Think about, for example, the Pat Thompson, right? The one who's going through cancer. Obviously, we want to pray for healing. We want to pray that all the cancer is gone. But they're also taking chemotherapy. So start really thinking about them. Well, they're taking chemo, and I know what that does to a person. God, I pray that you would please... <coughs> Remove some of the nausea that they may have. I pray that you will please help with the side effects that they're having as a result of this. I pray that you will please help strengthen their family because they're dealing with a difficult time. I pray that if they're having financial problems as a result of all this treatment, God, that you would please help them out and bless them. And, you know, think about, really think about what's going on in people's lives and all of the repercussions and all the impacts that the one little thing that we have on our list, you know, everything that goes along with that. And start praying for all of the various aspects of what's going on. When you're praying, you get creative, you think about one of the things that I pray for, it, for especially for people's salvation, unsaved family members, what is, their, what is their stumbling block? If you don't know, God, help reveal that stumbling block. I God, remove that stumbling block. God, if that stumbling block is money, God, I pray that you would please make them dirt poor. God, if that stumbling block is their pride, God, I pray that you would please let them be abased so that they could humble themselves and come to you. God, whatever their stumbling block is, you may know it, you may not know it, pray for those things. Right? Think about it. My point is just think about these people and really be effective, you know, effectual in your prayer and fervent in, in, in wanting, truly wanting these prayers to be answered. Matthew 6, we're going to close with this. This is a template. Girls, sit still and pay attention. Matthew chapter 6, which <laughs> it's actually kind of funny. Jesus says, look at verse number 5. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. This is the people that just praying, like I mentioned earlier, because everybody likes it when someone says they're going to pray for you, right? It's just to be, to be heard of men. Oh, yeah, I'm so spiritual. You know, look at me, how nice I am to be praying for everyone. That is not the point of prayer at all. Don't be like the hypocrite. People don't all need to be hearing some big oration that you have to God, right? That's not what it's about. 
Verse 6, he says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thy, thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. No, not everyone needs to know all of your prayers. I, I mentioned about praying with your spouse. Okay, That's a good thing, but you should also have some time alone with God as well. You could do both. Okay, And obviously the, the, the goal of praying with your spouse is not so that you could be seen of your spouse and that they could just hold you in a high regard. That wasn't the point of it, like the, the hypocrites do. So you're, not, you're still not praying as the hypocrite does. It's, it's, it's a good thing to do, but he, what he's, the whole point he's making here is, look, you don't need to be seen or heard of anybody because God hears you. And you don't need to make a spectacle out of it because you just pray to God knowing that he's going to hear you, and, and God, which, which sees in secret, he'll reward thee openly. He'll, he'll answer prayers openly, um, but you just go to him. Verse number seven, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So we have a, we have a time limit on this challenge. Don't spend that 15 minutes going, you know, God, please bless me. God, please bless me. God, please bless me. You know, whatever. You know, God, don't, don't just repeat yourself and chant over and over again. That's what the heathen do, okay? When you're praying, you're talking to God. We're speaking to him. We're asking him for things. He says, um, be not ye therefore, verse number eight, like unto them, for your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And I think this is real telling that he just gets done saying, don't use vain repetitions, repeat yourself over and over again. And then we're going to start into what's called the Lord's Prayer. Yet we still have so many people out there that when they, they pray, they think they need to just chant the Lord's Prayer. As if that's going to get through. He said, no, don't, don't do vain repetitions. You don't need to say 20 Our Fathers to get a hold of God. The whole point of what he's, what he's giving him here, he says, after this manner, therefore pray. So in this way, in this likeness. He didn't say, use these words exactly to pray unto God. He says, this is the way. This is the manner. So here's a sample prayer to give you an idea of how you ought to be going to God. After this manner, therefore pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He starts off giving reverence and respect unto God. Our Father, you know, your name is hallowed. Your name is holy, God. Just right off the bat, giving God just respect, okay? That's what you, you're not treating him, God, you know, I'm having, you know, and just, and just kind of lowering the status of God to just like a, maybe your common friend. You know, when you start off your prayer, God, you know, your name's holy. Holy, hallowed be thy name. He says, verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So he's, he's giving acknowledgement now saying, God, I'm going to come and ask you for prayer. I'm asking you for something. But right off the bat, I want to know, I want your will to be done. I want it to be what you want. Jesus Christ, went, when he went to God in prayer, asking if there was any other way, because he, did, he didn't want to go to the cross. Personally, he didn't want to have to go through and endure all of that stuff. He says, God, if there's any other way, let's do it another way. If there's any other way that I could you know, atone for the sins of the world and I can do this. I do want to do this. I want to do the work that you have for me to do and I want to save people. But if there's any other way, can we do it that way, God? And he says, either way, thy will be done, O Lord. So he's committed to God's will. But he's just saying, God, if, if we can do this some other way, please let me know because I would rather do it another way. And there wasn't another way. And Jesus did it. And of course. But when we go to God in prayer, we want God's will to be done. God, you know, whatever it is that you have planned, the things that I can't see, the things that I don't know right now, there's these problems going on. First of all, I, I want to make sure that your will is done. Verse number 11, give us this day our daily bread. So now he now he's gets into his prayers and asks, you know, God, can you feed me today? He's not saying give me food stored up for a month for when the apocalypse happens so that I could just have everything good to go and my bug out. You know, he's saying, no, can I, God, please feed me today. I'm worried about today. Give me, give me my food today. Give me my daily bread, Lord. Help me to, to get through today. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Lord. Uh, you know, the, the infractions that we have, the debts that we owe, God, forgive us of those things the same way that we're forgiving other people. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Lord. Help us um, not to be tempted away by the lust of our flesh. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's a sample prayer unto God. 
We could use that when we go to God. Give God the respect. You address God properly. You know, make sure you're praying that God's will is done, that you're focused on what God wants to have happen, not just something that you could consume on your own lusts, consume, you know, the, just the desires of your own heart that, that have nothing to do with God's will, right? We're focused on what God wants and that we're asking for our basic necessities. Give me some food, Lord. You know, help me to, to do your, help me not to get into sin, God. And help me to be forgiving and have a good attitude just like, you know, that you have towards us. And help me to do the same for others. You know, real basic sample prayer. So hopefully we could all participate in this. That's my goal. I want everyone to get involved in this uh, for the month of March. We'll be doing another challenge and in the following month. So this is kind of like training. We're training ourselves. We're training ourselves to soul one. We're training ourselves to pray. We'll be training ourselves to do other things for the entire course of the month. I want this at the forefront of your mind that we make sure that we're not forgetting these people and we're making sure that prayer is an important part of your daily life. Okay? And you, you don't have to wait till March 1st to start this. You can start it today. I encourage you to do so. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you so much for, for being such a loving Father that you hear us, dear God, when we call unto you, when we come to you with our requests. God, I pray that you please help our will to be more in line with yours. Pray that you would please um, help us in, in all of our areas. God, help us to get through this challenge. I pray that you please help us to form good new habits where we're setting aside time, regularly scheduled time, just as much as I have a schedule at work, just as much as I have a time that's scheduled for other things in my life, dear Lord, that we are scheduling this time to pray to you and recognize it as being very important, dear Lord, and that we wouldn't just skip these things and that, uh, that we would put them first in our life, dear Lord, that we would seek First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that all these things can be added unto us in, the, in our necessities, dear Lord. Pray all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.